Once upon a time, a daughter was complaining to her father that her life was miserable and that she didn't know how she was going to make it. She was tired of fighting and struggling all the time. As soon as one problem was solved, another one soon followed. Her father smiled softly, stood up, and took her to the kitchen. He filled three pots with water and placed each one on a high fire. Once the three pots began to boil, he placed potatoes in one pot, eggs in the second pot, and ground coffee beans in the third pot. Welcome to Stone Cold Moderation, a thinking man's journey toward a healthier relationship with alcohol. I'm your host, Chase Lee. Let's continue with our story. He then let them sit and boil, without saying a word. The daughter rolled her eyes and waited impatiently. After twenty minutes, he turned off the burners. He took the potatoes out of the pot and placed them in a bowl. He pulled the eggs out and placed them in a bowl. He then ladled the coffee out and placed it in a cup. Turning to her, he asked, Daughter, what do you see? Potatoes, eggs, and coffee, she hastily replied. Look closer, he said, and touch the potatoes. She did so, and she noticed that they were soft. He then asked her to take an egg and break it. After pulling off the shell, she observed its hard-boiled interior. Finally, he asked her to sip the coffee. Its rich aroma brought a smile to her face. Dad, what are you trying to say, she asked. He then explained that the potatoes, the eggs, and the coffee beans had each faced the same adversity, the boiling water. However, each one had reacted differently. The potatoes went in firm and strong, but in boiling water, they had become soft and weak. The eggs were fragile at first, with just a thin outer shell protecting a liquid interior, until they were put in the boiling water. There the inside of the eggs had become hard. The ground coffee beans, on the other hand, were unique. After they were exposed to the boiling water, they changed the water and created something new. Which are you? he asked his daughter. When adversity knocks on your door, how do you respond? Are you a potato, an egg, or a coffee bean? The moral of the story. In life, things happen around us, things happen to us. But the only thing that truly matters is what happens within us. Which one are you? All right, nice little parable there that I quite enjoyed. The potato, the egg, and the coffee beans. Um, Various versions of that floating around on the internet. So I'm going to assume that I'm not infringing on anyone's intellectual property by reading that on my podcast. But um, yeah, anywho. Um, I think the the point of that parable for me, um, when faced with an obstacle, a problem, as so often happens in life, I mean... I guess life is just a string of obstacles to overcome. We can either hide away, wilt in in the face of the obstacle or embrace it and face it head on. Certainly easier said than done. And I'll be the first one to tell you that, especially in these times of COVID-19 and kind of the mass anxiety that has mm, been created um, because of that. 
um, it's kind of sucked the life out of me personally. I've really been struggling to find motivation to kind of just do simple day-to-day things that I need to do to move forward. And it's really kind of disconcerting and unfortunate looking back, I don't know, like six months ago and how productive I felt about myself and in my life. And now just being like, damn, can't, I'm not doing anything. Um, just the idleness has kind of taken over. But again, this is an obstacle that we're all facing. Um, so we have two options. We can face it or we can um, let it kind of dampen our spirits, so to speak. But again, easier said than done. Um, for me, faced with an, an obstacle, getting started is one of the most dif- is the most difficult step. I am a, God, I am just a chronic procrastinator, right? An expert in procrastination. Um, I've been like that all my life and it's, it's still kind of a mystery to me, right? I mean, the anxiety of doing the thing for me completely is completely alleviated once I start doing it. Um, but it's so difficult to start sometimes and it can even be for matters of health too. Um, you know, we, something something is wrong. So we have a toothache and we procrastinate about it because we just don't want to deal with it. Right. It's like stepping, it's like stepping into some, some unknown place. And I guess like leaving the, the immediate comfort zone that we've est- established for ourselves, um, can be scary and cause anxiety. Um, and for drinking that, that definitely can come into play as well. I procrastinated on changing my drinking for many, many years. Right. Um, but I think what it comes down to is of course starting and what happens after that I always have observed with myself is that momentum and action equal confidence so for me confidence doesn't come out of out of thin air right but if I start to do the thing and I get some momentum going the anxiety kind of dissipates I feel more comfortable I feel the momentum and then that's where the confidence comes from to do something to solve any problem. So um, I digress. Let's get back to the matter of drinking. Um, How to get started. It's, I think it's a question that anyone who is looking to make a change will have to, will have to face. And there's many ways to go about it. And what's the best way to do it? The question I asked myself at first was, and the question I'm asking today for this episode, is it better to quit cold turkey Is it better to try to go sober for like a a trial period for say 30 days, 60 days, I don't know. Or is it better to gradually taper off whether you are trying to kind of fall into moderation or if you're trying to go completely sober? What's the best way to do it, okay? So I figured um, that, well, I I will certainly be sharing my opinions and my experiences, but that I would consult with a couple of experts, okay? So um, I contacted a couple people and I got some excellent, excellent responses. The first response I got was from Ruby Warrington, who is a journalist and author. She's the founder of a magazine and online publishing company called The Numinous. And she is the author of a book called Sober Curious, which came out last year in 2019. She is originally from the UK and currently residing in New York City. So here is her response to that question. Is it better to quit cold turkey or is it better to gradually taper off? This is Ruby Warrington. I'm the author of the book Sober Curious. And the question of moderation is something that I get asked about all the time. I have always been quite anti-moderation, largely because I tried and failed myself so many times to moderate my alcohol intake. And as somebody who now has chosen total abstinence, um, but when I say chosen, I didn't hit a rock bottom with my drinking. I didn't attend AA. I'm not in a program. Abstinence has just proven itself to me to be the best option for me when it comes to alcohol. But as somebody who is now abstinent by choice, I look back at my years of trying to moderate my drinking as essentially trying to keep something in my life, trying to bargain with this substance. 
which was ultimately doing me harm and which ultimately had no place in my life. So for anybody who's really serious about changing their drinking or experiencing how amazing it is to live alcohol free or to live hangover free, as I like to put it, um, I just think moder- moderation just keeps can, can keep a person locked in that same cycle for way longer than is necessary. I do believe that um, an extended period of abstinence is necessary for anybody who really wants to change their drinking, even if that means they may occasionally take a drink um, in the future. But for me, 100 days is a really good um, length of time to give yourself to properly get over the hump of your cravings, to distance yourself enough from your drinking behaviors so you can really see what was going on when you're craving a drink, when you're reaching for a drink, when you're engaging with the drinking culture. 100 days is a really great break time um, to be able to get a handle on what's really going on here. So I fully recommend having a hard stop for 100 days if you want to change your drinking. From there, you'll be in a much better position to assess whether this is really something that has any place in your life. Now, very recently, I did an interview with a a guy called Light Watkins, um, who's a longtime sober meditation teacher um, about how he quit drinking 20 years ago. And this did make me see moderation slightly differently. So he, when he wanted to remove alcohol from his life, he chose to wean himself consciously off alcohol over the period of a couple of months with the end goal and intention of quitting completely. What this meant was that he consistently and steadily drank less over that time period. Now, he wasn't a big drinker to begin with, but it just meant that he slowly, slowly weaned himself off until he reached his goal date and that was it. He didn't drink again after that. He never went back to it. His reasoning being that quitting cold turkey sometimes can be such a test of your willpower that you will swing back in the opposite direction in what he called the pendulum effect and go hard again when you kind of like crash out the other side of your abstinence. So it did make me see moderation differently. I think that if you have a goal, if your intention, and you can be really honest with yourself about this, is to quit then perhaps weaning yourself off gradually might be a sustainable way to approach that. So I hope this um, insight helps and that you, for whatever reason you are quitting, thinking about quitting, moderating, um, have found this useful. Thanks for having me here. Okay, so next up we have Dwayne Brown, who is the founder of DB Mindsets. He is a mindset coach, a hypnotherapist, and a neuro-linguistic programming practitioner, which is pretty interesting. Um, He is originally from the UK, but currently residing on the west coast of of Australia. I asked him the same question, but luckily I was able to have a little bit more of an extended uh, conversation with Dwayne Brown. We actually caught up um, a few days back, and here was our conversation. Yeah, well... Now, yeah, I mean, now that we've kind of, you've started um, kind of talking about your, your, your story a little bit, because that's the first thing I was going to actually going to ask you, um, yeah, okay. like about kind of how would you, how would you describe yourself as a drinker in the past? If you, if you wanted to share that, um, what kind of drinker were you in the past? Um, and eventually kind of how did you end up conquering your problem? Um Become and becoming the, um, I guess, a more controlled drinker today. Yeah, well, I um, I don't like the term alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't like pigeonholing anything, actually, or, or genres and stuff like that. I, I was like I said, I started drinking when I was very young, and it's. It was more a point of frustration of life, really. Like, I, I, alcohol itself is a symptom rather than a disease, and it's normally used as a comfort blanket or, or a crutch or whatever for what's really going on. And I think I grew up with very low self-esteem, and actually drinking, I hid that behind drunkenness because, like, when you're drunk, you lose your inhibitions and stuff like that. So from a very early age, that was what I did. I think that's what a lot of people did, and everybody went out and got wasted at the weekend, and we, you know, you drink every day of the week. 
you'd, you'd go to work, come home, have a few drinks during the week, and then Thursday or Friday, the, the weekend would start when you'd actually drink heavy, and then, you know, for three days straight, you'd go out partying, night clubbing and drinking. So, yeah, I was a binge drinker, like a lot of people in England. It was a big part of the culture. And it's very difficult not to drink in between that. Um, but yeah, and this went on for many years. Like I came to Australia, I came over here backpacking when I was 30 and then I actually managed to move over here when I was 34. So between the ages of like, yeah, 14 and 30, 34, I was, that was when I was drinking a lot. And then eventually sort of realised I want better things from life and managed to sort it out. But what really made me sort it out was when I actually discovered personal development, which I'd, I'd never heard of in the past, didn't know anything about it. Um, but I was just so fed up in my day job. And I just uh, bought a house which I'm in now, and I, I, I was trying to figure out a way how I didn't have to <laughs> go to work every day and how I could work from home and, and have a, you know, work from home. So I, I looked into how do people make money online, and it took me down a rabbit hole of internet marketing. So I did a few courses on internet marketing and got into, into that, and one of the niches to, to market, which a lot of people were talking about, was personal development. So I started, this is what got me involved in personal development. And in the end, I got more interested in the personal development side of things than the actual marketing. And long story short, I became a NLP coach and hypnotherapist. And when I was doing my training for this, this is when I really managed to get rid of my alcohol challenges. Which are you, if you don't mind me asking, are you completely um, alcohol free now, or do you do you moderate at all? I I do drink. I drink as much as I want to, which is hardly anything. I to really uh, what I did first was I went totally alcohol free, probably for two years, I'd say. Um, I don't know if I would have been able to just go straight to moderation or not. It, it's, it's one of them things, everybody's different and the way everybody's mind works is different. So, and every ha everybody has different circumstances and pressures on them. So yeah, I don't know. I, I found I had to, it, it was all or nothing for me when I was drinking. I couldn't just have just a one or two. If I, if I started drinking, I'd be drinking all night and all day just binge drinking so for me actually going alcohol free for a couple of years I think really helped and then you know I'd have a drink here and there after that and I could it was very easy to feel myself get on that slippery slope again once I started drinking but with the NLP coaching and the skills I, I'd gained I was able to put a stop to it and now I can just have a beer here and there if I want to. But even just having two beers in a night, I'll, I'll notice it the next day. My ability to deal with stress is a lot less if I've just had a little bit to drink. But it's nice to be able to have a drink if you catch up with friends who drink or whatever. And it's nice to know you've got the skills and the strength to be able to have just the one when everybody else is drinking which I think is a massive challenge for a lot of people is the people around them when they actually want to change their drinking habits. Yeah. So now you are, as you said, you're a mindset coach. So I understand that you help uh, clients with, with their drinking problems. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's not the main thing. Um, just drinking, but that is something which often crops up. And generally when, someone has a drinking challenge then like i said before the alcohol is just a symptom it's always something deeper and once you start actually coaching with people and working with people you find out what that is and then people don't even know 
what that is half the time themselves. And with coaching, this can be uncovered and people are, go, are like, yeah, okay, I can understand why I do this now. And actually have, realizing why you're drinking in the first place is a great help for a lot of people. And then we can work on them areas. And then the actual quitting of alcohol or cutting down becomes a lot easier. Right. So, um, the episode of this podcast that, um, what we're doing right now, the question is like, how do you, how do you start if you're somebody who's interested in going alcohol free or somebody like me who is interested in practicing moderation, my question, and I think it's the question of that's shared by a lot of people. Is it better to kind of go, go cold Turkey into that? Or is a gradual kind of digression into that more effective? Um, and it's a question that I've kind of seen on, you know, like Facebook groups and like in chat rooms, um, yeah. so to speak. So what would your opinion be on? What would your opinion be on that on that matter? It's not. Um, everybody's different. Like everybody has different challenges and circumstances and different reasons for drinking. It's not something, there's not one more answer for one person. Like if you're somebody who's drank for many, many years and you've become an expert at it, you know, it's become a very ingrained habit. It's not so easy to just cut down. Um, but it all depends on, you know, who you are and, and why you're drinking. Like this is this is why coaching is so great because you can actually work with people to determine where they are and you know what's best for them. In in your experience as a coach, have you created like I guess like drinking plan like a drinking plan or like a, a strategy with some of your clients? Um, and if so, like what what was that kind of what did that entail? Well, the first plan is generally find out the reasons people are drinking and, and what, and it's generally, you know, it's things like self-esteem, confidence, and, you know, other problems people are trying to cover up. So, so we go to the root of the problem. And then once people can actually start working on the root of the problem, then the quitting of alcohol or, or cutting down becomes a lot easier. Uh, a big problem people have is cravings because drinking is, is a habit. It's, you know, you, you form the neural networks in your mind, in your brain over years of drinking and it's become a really ingrained habit. So you can have all the motivation in the world and all the reasons to, to cut down and stop drinking. But if the cravings are still there, there's this little voice, this little feeling telling you, you you need a drink and stuff. So with NLP, we can actually turn them cravings off. And I do actually have a free course on YouTube of being able to use NLP to sort of tackle your alcohol cravings. Right. So what are, I guess, on a daily basis with your clients when the issue of alcohol comes up? Um, I guess, could you go more more in depth on what are some like the day to day activities or techniques strategies that you use with them yeah okay a lot of the time it is it is a strategy um a big one for people is coming home from work like they've had a hard day at work stressful day at work they just want to unwind so they automatically go to the cupboard get out the bottle of wine sit in front of the tv put their feet up just to relax for a bit and then that glass of wine turns into another and another and before you know it you're asleep in front of the tv and it, it's the next morning. Uh, and that's just the strategy. And that strategy can be changed quite easily by actually coming home and not opening and covering and getting a bottle of wine out. It's actually going, coming home and going out for a walk or something like that. Or even the act of opening, if you come home and um, you drink every day, even the act of opening the front door is an anchor. It's a trigger to what you're going to do next, which would be go to the cupboard and get a drink out. So even just changing the strategies of what you do every day can 
health impacts on what you're going to do with your drinking. And hypnotherapy, that's pretty, for me, pretty fascinating. I've never, I have no knowledge at all um, about that topic. How does, how, how does that fit into like what, what you do and how does that help people with their, their alcohol challenges? Well, the hypnotherapy itself, it's actually when people are in, in trance, it's a way to communicate with the unconscious mind and the unconscious mind is where all your habits, emotions, and ultimately behaviors are stored. And a lot of the time, well, drinking, once you get an expert at it, it is an unconscious habit of behavior, um, just like any addiction. And they're all stored down in, in your unconscious mind. So when we can use hypnotherapy and we can talk to your unconscious mind, we can actually get to the reasons people are drinking. And we can actually alter the emotion people attach to drinking or seeing a pub or seeing a nice refreshing drink once it's a trigger which is stored in people's unconscious mind for example if you you see a nice refreshing cold glass of beer in your mind on a hot day it's going to want it's, you're going to want to drink a glass of beer but if you can change that emotion in your unconscious mind to when you see a glass of ice cold beer actually getting the feeling of being hungover or any of the bad effects from drinking, it can, it can totally alter the emotion of how you feel about drinking. And this is what's so good about NLP and hypnotherapy is we can actually communicate with the unconscious mind and change these emotions, what make people drink. It's like um, if, you, if you smell fresh cut grass, or hear a piece of music, this is something which you probably experienced it will, will trigger an emotion and make you feel a feeling or take you back to a time. And this is all stored in your unconscious mind. And we can actually change these anchors and triggers so that you don't get certain emotions or you can get different emotions. So, yeah. And, and also you, are as it says on your website you're an nlp master practitioner um that's also new to me what could you take a minute to explain what nlp is um yeah and how you use that yeah nlp it stands for neural linguistic programming and it's basically it's communicating with the unconscious mind by use of language when i say language it's the our five senses and the way we interpret the world around us. Like, for instance, what I was saying about you know, fresh cut grass, you smell it, it will take you back, it will give you an emotion. This is what NLP is. It's its the way you, you've you communicated with your mind through your sense of smell. Like when you smell fresh cut grass, that you, you've communicated with your unconscious with that smell and you've you've stored feelings in there in the past. And with NLP, we can we can find these feelings, we can change these feelings, and you know we can alter different emotions. So it's basically the way the way we talk to our unconscious mind and the way we program it, which is why it's called neuro linguistic programming. I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> what no, I just said. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually kind of doing a quick search on that right now um yeah those, those are those are new to me but um yeah. T tony robbins is probably the most famous nlp practitioner you've heard of him oh uh, yes of course okay oh, yeah okay. and um he has he has some quite good explanations of it but the way i like to explain it is it's the way we communicate with our unconscious mind through our five senses and basically our unconscious mind it doesn't question it takes it takes you for your words. So if you tell it that you're an alcoholic, it will believe you're an alcoholic. If you if you tell it you're going to have a great day, it's going to strive to see the good in a day and you're going to have a great day. Mm -hmm. So with hypnotherapy and NLP, we can actually create these emotions and, and get rid of the bad emotions. 
And what percent, I mean, if you could give like a rough estimate, like what percent of your clients um, kind of have alcohol problems or I guess in your workings with them, alcohol is addressed as something that they need to focus on? Um, don't really deal with too many people just specifically for alcohol because once a lot of the time people will come to you and say I want to stop drinking I want to stop smoking and it's not that that's just a symptom so when we start working on the other stuff that's when they really start to get their lives together and be able to quit alcohol or smoking or, or whatever it is but percentage wise um but people come to me for all sorts of reasons. Just alcohol is just one of them things. And it's because it's because I um, have the Facebook groups and pages to do with alcohol. It's because it's something I've been through myself. So it's something I'm familiar with. I'm aware of what the challenges are. And basically, at the end of the day, it means all those years, which I thought I'd wasted by being drunk, can actually count for something. So I can actually help people now before they have to go through the years of sort of pain and frustration that I did. Um, but it's very hard to say how many people, you know, the, the alcohol thing's for, because generally once you start working with people, you find out that's not the actual issue, it's something else. stuff um so moving right along a couple of reflections from the comments of our guest contributors uh first ruby warrington um she stated how she was anti pretty strict strictly anti-moderation which i completely appreciate um she mentioned that she didn't seem it would it was worth it to kind of fight this battle with a substance so anybody who is really serious about making a change um, she consider going alcohol free as kind of the best the best case scenario. And I definitely appreciate those comments, and to a certain extent, I definitely agree. Um, I think if if you are somebody who is yeah fighting this daily battle, trying trying to moderate, but really fighting and feeling like that's taking more out of you um, than I guess contributing healthily to your to your existence yeah definitely i think it's definitely time that's definitely a clear-cut sign that it's time to go alcohol free and certainly i would say that alcohol free is more healthy than moderation and better than moderation for sure um as i've said many times drinking alcohol in any in any quantity is dangerous and harmful um but I guess my response to that would be from personal experience in my own, for myself, I don't feel like I'm personally fighting that battle yet. I feel like the changes that I've made have been really impactful and kind of, I guess, well received by my myself, if that makes any sense. Um, so I don't feel like I'm, I'm fighting a daily battle with it. If I ever get to that point, I, I think I will probably make a change. I probably will just go completely alcohol free if I feel like it's not worth it to you know, if I feel like I'm constantly being tempted to drink and I feel like my my alcohol consumption is, is trending up instead of trending down like it currently is, yeah, I think I'll definitely consider making a change. Um, and, I, I, yeah, I just want to piggyback on comments I've made before that, I, I mean, I I do feel that everyone's journey is different. So I think, you know, her journey, she found that moderation didn't work for her. Um, alcohol free was the best, was the best, you know, version of herself, best case scenario. Um, but again, I think everyone's journey is their journey and it's important to, to remember that. Um, so yeah, but excellent comments. Um, hard stop of a hundred days is what she recommended to kind of get things moving. That's awesome. Um, I think that would be really daunting for a lot of people. A hundred, the idea of like a hundred days without alcohol, especially especially somebody who is dependent on alcohol. Um, but I think is a, a really 
a really excellent, excellent way to, to start the process of change. Um, I really liked the story of that she shared of an acquaintance of her who, uh, you know, decided to gradually wean off of alcohol as a means to avoid some massive test of will. And that really struck a chord with me um, because, for example, on a lot of Facebook groups that I'm members of every day, it seems like people leave comments saying, you know, I, I drank last night. I fucked up. I'm on day one again. I feel terrible. I feel like a failure. And it seems like those moments can be really damaging for people. Um, and this way to, you know, this, this approach of gradually weaning off could be, could prove useful in sort of avoiding those moments. So for people who are trying to go sober, um, the fact that you drink a little bit on a certain occasion doesn't seem like a big fuck up and a big, um, yeah, uh, like a a a moment of weakness and a a failure because it, it definitely seems like the shame that comes with those moments of saying, oh, I fucked up. I feel terrible about myself. That could definitely lead to more drinking and are could generally be very damaging to one's psyche, I imagine. Um, so yeah, interesting thing to think about. And I, I, I thank Ruby immensely for her comments. Excellent stuff there. Um, okay. So moving on to Dwayne. Um, I think his, something that kind of stood out for me was saying that alcohol is never the root issue when he works with people. Um, he's never just dealing with the alcohol. He's always dealing with something else. What is the root of the problem? Is it low self-esteem? Is it anxiety? Totally agree. Um, yeah, I mean, alcohol, yeah, it's never just, it's never just one thing, right? Everything is interconnected. Your, yeah, your, your mental health, your mental world and, um, your consumption of substances. Um, so I definitely agree with that, but I guess the the one thing that I was thinking about, and this is this is why I so greatly value the conversation that I had with Dr. Lynn Cooper on my last episode, is you know when she was talking about that alcohol is so is used for enhancement as well, and relating that to my life, how in the past when things were going really well, I wanted to. I wanted to drink as a way of kind of celebrating as a way of kind of enhancing that, that current feeling. Right. Um, so of course I, I agree, I agree with Dwayne that it's never, you know, it's, there's, there's always a, a cause of, for the consumption and usually it's, it's something negative, right. It comes from a lack of self-worth, um, something along those lines, but also, um, as I learned from Dr. Cooper and as I experienced for myself, Alcohol is also used for enhancement. So when people are feeling great, um, they tend to want to drink as well. So complicated stuff, but I definitely, I definitely appreciate his, his approach there. And he also talked about how, well, his, his view is that to answer the question, is it better to go, go cold turkey or gradually um, wean off alcohol that a person must decide for themselves for themselves um, what will be the best way to proceed and I definitely I definitely agree with that um, yeah I mean as I said each journey has to be each person's journey has to be their own and again I just really like the the idea of recovery as not something that is linear right? It's not a straight line. It's going to be a line with some, some ups and downs, but as long as it is heading in the right direction, there's something to be proud of. And there is achievement in, in that. All right. So final thoughts for today's episode, wrapping things up. I want to um definitely say very clearly that if you are somebody who is dependent on alcohol um perhaps you consider yourself an alcoholic if you use that terminology uh stopping cold turkey could be dangerous for your health and i am obviously not a medical doctor or somebody who has um is a scientist on these matters but 
I, as is kind of, I guess, commonly known at this point, um, stopping cold turkey for people who are very dependent on alcohol can be dangerous. So I would definitely, if you're somebody who um, has doubts about that, to definitely consult a doctor or a medical professional. So um, my opinion in answering this question, is it better to gradually taper off? Is it better to go cold turkey when making a change? Um, I hope this is not kind of a cop out, but I feel that it's, it's something that each individual must make for his or herself. Um, knowing your body, knowing your, knowing your kind of habits of drinking, what will, what, what, what do you think will give you the best chance of success, whether it be stopping yourself and, you know, going through that test of willpower, if you're somebody who kind of embraces situations like that. Or if you're somebody who thinks that that would lead to failure, um, setting up a system that in place to maybe gradually decrease your alcohol, alcohol consumption could be very effective. So yeah, having a plan, having strategy, having a system, I think always in any situation when solving a problem is key, right? And I think consistency in action is key. If there's something that you do every day that you know helps you deal with like your alcohol cravings or just helps you get into a more positive frame of mind, for example, constant exercise, consistent exercise, meditation, staying consistent in those things, um, I think absolutely crucial. Um, and m most importantly, I, I think if you know if you fuck up, keep moving forward, right? If you if you hit an obstacle, if you if you have a, a moment of weakness, a moment of failure, to just keep going. I, I'm not somebody who has ever done like a count, and I guess I'm lucky for this. I've never done like a day. One, I'm on day one. I'm on day two. I'm on day three. And again, I've I've never tried to go completely sober. But it, it just I've, I've I'm always struck by the fact that somebody could be, you know, have this have a streak of like. 30 days or 100 days or 300 days whatever and then they they drink and they screw up and then they're back to day one that just seems so counterproductive right because it just seems like a yeah that massive failure is going to is going to and that shame that's going to come for that the disappointment and possibly like the self-loathing that comes from a big loss like that taking taking a huge l um that just seems really counterproductive. It doesn't seem it doesn't seem practical to me. It doesn't seem healthy, um, and it just seems very, very win loss, very black and white. Um, and, and yeah, and again, just kind of kind of kind of impractical. Um, if if recovery is a nonlinear line, that's redundant. But you know what I'm you know what I'm trying to say then why hold yourself to why hold your feet to the fire in, in such a way right so i mean as i see it if, if you're going for 30 days sober and on day five you have a couple drinks maybe get a little tipsy maybe you get drunk yeah you fucked up but just keep i move on to day six i i don't i don't understand i don't see i i personally feel that for me that would be better if i just continue to move on holding keeping in mind that you need to hold yourself to high standards right being honest with yourself, yeah, like you screwed up, but then moving on after that. Um, for me, that just seems like a, a more healthy way to kind of handle this problem. So those are my two cents. Keep moving forward. Stay strong. Godspeed. According to a Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. This has been the Stone Cold Moderation Podcast with Chase Lee. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out the complete show notes of this episode on stonecoldmoderation.com where you can learn more about us. For access to more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channels, check us out on all other social media platforms, and make sure to tune in next time. We'll be talking about alcohol and risky sex. <laughs>